mit euch. Welcome one and all. Um, I'm Charlotte von Robert. Uh, the um, the director of the Tavi Center for Jewish Studies, um, among other things. Um, and so nice to see people in in person, even though with masks. Um, and we are particularly um, excited to welcome our guest. But I'm here to welcome the and introduce. Um, the colleague and friend who's going to introduce our <laughs> our uh, visitor, and that is uh, Gabriella Safran, who is uh, has been for as long as I've been here and longer uh, the core part of the core faculty of um, of um, the Center for Jewish Studies, and she teaches in Slavics. Um, in the Center for Russian and East European Literature by the Slavics Department. Um, Gabriela has um, run so many things at uh, this university of ours, from department to division, and now most recently um, she has uh, become my boss, the boss of <laughs> some of us in this room, uh, the Associate Dean of uh, the humanities. Um, so I'm really, really happy that we could get a little piece of your time um, to help us welcome Sam Spinner. Um, and I also, before I hand over to Gabriela, um, really want to thank my um, our staff, uh, Sh Dr. Shana Hammerman, um, who are just, uh, we have so many things going on and over Zoom and over, uh, coming on board it uh, during the COVID year and whatnot. So to get all this organized and you've never been in this space even before. Uh, so it's just amazing. And Eva Clem, who's outside um, trying to <laughs> welcome everyone into the building. Um, so thank you. Um, but with this, I hand it over to you, Gabriela. And I think I go on. Hey, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really pleased that I get to uh, introduce Sam Spinner, um, who is uh, whom I met for the first time when he was a PhD student at Columbia University. Um, I gave a talk about my book uh, at Columbia, and Sam very politely and gently and accurately pointed out a mistake in it <laughs> um, <laughs> and he was right and um, I then corrected it in the Russian translation um, of the book and um, so I really uh, I feel that you know there was a lot this guy um, so Sam Spinner has um, PhD from Columbia works in Yiddish and also German, so across uh, different language um, lines, and also works both in um, literature and in uh, kind of art history, it kind of asks art historical kinds of questions. He's, uh, since getting the PhD at Columbia, he has taught um, Yiddish and Jewish studies at UCLA for a few years and then began to teach at Hopkins, which is also where he got his BA. Um, his, uh, his work, his re research, his teaching covers um, Yiddish and German Jewish literature and culture uh, from the 19th century through to the present. Uh, he's interested in modernism, um, anthropology and its history, uh, museum studies, visual culture, Holocaust studies, um, lots of other things. He is the author of this book, Jewish Primitivism, um, which we published here at Stanford University Press uh, uh, just this year. So it's a July 2021 book. Um, it looks at the kind of connections between how, um, how Jewish identity uh, is understood um, in the uh, in the modernist period, so sort of late 19th, early 20th century, um, looking from all these different perspectives, sort of literary perspectives, 
um, visual, visual art, um, ethnography, and um, and he's he's understanding that um, that you can't take any of these things in isolation. You can't just say uh, Jewish identity is this kind of you know product of a kind of ethnographic and political set of ideas, or just literary, or just visual. All these things are bound up, um, and it's always it's always in contact with um, with how other other uh, uh, kind of aesthetic discourses are happening at the same time, right? So what does, um, uh, how, how does Jewish modernism, primitivism relate to other modernisms and primitivisms? Um, I think it's a, it's a really, it's a really beautiful manuscript, a really beautiful book that I've read in manuscript. Uh, um, and, um, and it really, I think wonderfully shows us this thing about how Jews are both the subjects and the objects of the kind of primitivist gaze or the primitivizing gaze, right? And, and in thinking about that, we can maybe start to think in more complex ways about uh, what like the primitivizing gaze does in general, right? Um, so it's sort of, I think he, he has ideas that really go beyond Jewish studies and maybe speak more broadly to bigger discussions in, um, in academia. Sam is now moving on to um, another book, which he's tentatively called Monuments of Books, Holocaust Museums and Literature, where he thinks about monumentality, um, the aesthetics of monumentality in literature in relation to Holocaust remembrance um, and representation. And, and again, it's not just about books, it's also about kind of visual aesthetics, the aesthetics of of big monuments. Um, I think that's really enough from me. And I think we should welcome Professor Spinner. Thank you, Gabriella, for that very kind introduction. And let me also take the opportunity to abjectly apologize. <laughs> Now that I am all grown up and the author of a book myself, I can't contemplate what would have possessed me to do such a horrible thing. It was great. So sorry. I think it was in the form of a question. There's almost no possible way that it, that it could be excused, but um, so I'm sorry, and thank you for, despite that, um, you know, becoming such a, a kind and generous mentor to me. Um, it's a real honor to have been introduced by you, um, you know, both because you, you have been a mentor to me, but also because uh, an article that you wrote um, 15, 20 years ago or so uh, about Ansky and primitivism was so important in opening up um, this world, these ideas that I talk about in this book. So, you know, special thank you to, to Gabriella um, for being here, for introducing me. Um, thank you also to Shana and to Eva for organizing everything so nicely, to Eitan um, for, for inviting me here. It's um, very exciting to be here for my first in-person real life event uh, with colleagues in as long as I can remember. Um, hello also to the world on the internet. Um, I like you too, um, but it's, it's nice to be back in person. Um, so thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here. I'd also like to acknowledge Eva Loki. This is the inaugural Eva Loki Yiddish Studies Lecture. Um, anybody who has donated of their time and of their, um, and of their possessions to Yiddish studies deserves special thanks and acknowledgement. Um, Eva Loki, as I understand it, was you know, really instrumental in helping build Jewish studies at Stanford, supporting the teaching of Hebrew and of, uh, and of Yiddish. Um, and you know, that kind of generosity uh, needs to be you know, just acknowledged with gratitude. And I'm, I'm grateful. So thanks to Eva Loki and in her memory, um, you know, these, this lecture is, is, is dedicated. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try to both give you an overview of the book, um, which is hard to do in a very short period because I also want to go in depth on one of the chapters. So I'm gonna talk for maybe about a little less than 10 minutes to kind of set out some of the keywords, a little bit of the landscape of the book, show you a couple of pictures too, just to give you a sort of visual taste of some of the things that I talk about in the book. And then, um, and then go straight into one of the chapters that I'm going to, you know, present. I guess most of the 
interesting bits um, and, and try to give you a sense of an in-depth piece of the book. And then hopefully in the Q&A, if you know, somehow something doesn't make sense because I've tried to condense the rest of the book into eight minutes, you know, I hope that, that we can follow up there either about the book in general or about the specific uh, materials that I talk about um, in, the, in the extended discussion um, about the, the chapter that I'm gonna present. Um, also, I should say that um, you're all welcome to buy the book. Um, published by Stanford University Press. My editor, Margot Irvin, is here. And I'd like to thank Margot also for um, making my book an actual real thing. So <laughs> submitted on Friday, March the 13th, I submitted my manuscript. So that was the first and probably will be the only lucky Friday the 13th in history. Um, unlucky in every other respect, but lucky in that I sent in my manuscript and, and now it's a real book. So thank you, Marco. Um, if you order directly from Stanford University Press and use the discount code SPINNER20, you can get 20% off. <laughs> and I will send it to the people. And Shana will, will send the notice to everybody else online and we have a little flyer here so um yeah buy the book or just um listen and ask questions so again i'm going to talk for a little bit about the book in general and then and then talk in depth on one of the chapters so to give you a, a little little overview of the book in a 1910 speech yudlamid peretz the dominant figure of turn of the century yiddish literature in eastern europe declared quote two paths lie before us one path to europe where Jewish form will be destroyed, the second path back. By Jewish form, Peretz meant distinctly recognizably Jewish art and literature. But where was back? His answer, the Bible, Hasidic, folklorism. And those were the declensions and parts of speech he used. In Yiddish, Bibel, Hasidish, Volkstimlichkeit. Forward and backward were not the only directions Peretz used to orient his thinking on art. He also went up and down. He said, quote, art is a staircase and the ground floor is the primitive of the folk, end quote. So Peretz's compass of Jewish art pointed back to the folk and down to the primitive, the cardinal points of primitivism. In a 1912 speech, Franz Kafka pronounced, quote, once Yiddish has taken hold of you and moved you, and Yiddish is everything, the words, the Hasidic melody, and the essential character of this Eastern European Jewish actor himself. Kafka was introducing a, a, perform a performance. You will have forgotten your former reserve, then you will come to feel the true unity of Yiddish, end quote. That was 1912. In 1914, Kafka asked in his diary, quote, what do I have in common with Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself. I should stand quietly in a corner, happy that I can breathe, end quote. And in 1915, after visiting a Hasidic gathering in Prague, he commented, quote, looked at precisely, it was something like a savage African tribe, end quote. In the first statement, Kafka sees Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture as an exciting, vitalizing repudiation of the hollowed out westernized Judaism he identified with his father. In the next, he rejects the premise of an exoticizing ethnographic gaze and turns the lens on himself. Relative to the distance he feels from himself, the primitiveness of the Hasidim he would later compare to Africans is beside the point. And in the last, he seems to disparage Hasidic Jews by invoking a racist estimation of Africans. Taken all together, these are examples of Jewish primitivism. They participate in the same agenda as primitivism across European modernism, a critique of modernity activated by the belief that a better way of making art and a better way of living were to be found among those people considered by Europeans to lack civilization. Before humans were corrupted by modernity, so this line of thought goes, in fact, before they were corrupted by any civilization at all, they were truly free, truly creative, truly alive. For civilized, that is white, Christian, European peoples, this time of freedom, creativity, and vitality ended before recorded history. At the turn of the 20th century, however, European ethnographers and artists believed that such a state could still be found among so-called primitives who lived in a permanent state of prehistory. This belief became a powerful impetus for writers and artists. Paul Gauguin, arguably the first artist of modern primitivism, 
a painter, wrote that in order to produce the kind of art he admired, he needed to become, quote, savage in spite of myself. While this was the goal of most European primitivism, Jewish primitivism asserted a savage identity for Jews, not in spite of themselves, but because of themselves. Primitivism takes an object that is distinctly other and definitively not European. Hence the people enlisted by force or by fantasy to play the role of primitives were defined as everything Europeans supposedly were not, dark-skinned, illiterate, uncivilized, superstitious, prelogical. So Jewish primitivism by Jews of Jews should have been impossible. European Jews were often stereotyped both by themselves and by others as too modern, too urban, too political, too literate. And even if Hasidic and other Eastern European Jews superficially resembled more distant so-called primitives, why would European Jews valorize as vital and free a people actually among the most vulnerable in Europe? After all, neither Jews nor so-called primitive peoples had a place as equals in modern civilized Europe, and Jewish primitivists were certainly not arguing for the exclusion or subjugation of Jews. On the contrary, Jewish primitivism was a product of the effort to create and consolidate identity and nationhood through Jewish culture. European modernity depended, however, on the creation of ineradicable difference between the Jew and the Christian, between the folk and everyone else, between the civilized and the primitive. In imagining European Jews as primitive savages, European Jewish writers and artists blurred the border between savage and civilized. In other words, while primitivism more broadly was grounded in difference, Jewish primitivism disassembled that difference because from the perspective of European art and society, Jews were plausibly primitive, but also plausibly European. The result was a discourse that recognized its own impossibility a powerful critique of the necessity of Jewish inclusion that began from the premise of inclusion. I'd like to emphasize that Jewish primitivism was not an artistic movement. It had no defined agenda or style. It was rather a project with a direction, back or down, but no destination, a process without a fixed method or goal. The lack of fixity was shared across the various versions of Jewish primitivism. It allowed for ideological flexibility. It could be assimilationist or Zionist, revolutionary or reactionary. It allowed for linguistic flexibility, written in, in Yiddish, German, and in Hebrew. And it allowed for aesthetic flexibility, neo-romantic and modernist, literary, graphic, and photographic, based on models of orality and visuality, realist and abstract. So Jewish primitivism is part and parcel of a broad array of works of art and literature. Here's a quick pair of examples from my book. Elza Lasker Schuler, there we go. The German Jewish poet and artist introduced herself and signed her correspondence and often dressed up as Prince Yusuf, chief of what she called the Society of Savage Jews. These warriors also featured in her poetry in her prose and in her visual art. There's a drawing she made beautifully colored uh, with the title inscribed in German, Der Bund der Wilden Juden, the Society of Savage Jews. Um, and this Society of Savage Jews narrowed the gaps between, and her portrayal of them narrowed the gaps between genres and media and bridged the chasm between art and her performance of the Society of Savage Jews in life. Although Lasker Schuler was a bohemian and famously claimed to be unpolitical, her fantasy of unfettered primitivity, there's another drawing by her, the chieftains of the Society of Savage Jews, her fantasy revealed that the politics of Jewish primitivism were not only emancipatory, they could also be about domination. As in the Hebrew and Yiddish poetry of Lasker Schuler's friend, Uri Tzvi Greenberg, who borrowed the Society of Savage Jews for his own works, taking it and translating it literally into Hebrew, Brit HaYehudim HaPraim. While Lasker Schuler's savage Jew wore a dagger in his belt, inscribed with the word ve'ahavta, and thou shalt love. And you can see that it might be hard to see on the slide, but there's Prince Yusuf in the front and there's the dagger with the scabbard that reads ve'ahavta. Greenberg, for Greenberg, the savage Jews were an expression of his radical right-wing Zionist vision for the settlement of Palestine. Here's a picture of him together with the other two members of the so-called Brit Habirionim, a self-declared fascist militia that, uh, that he had founded in Palestine. 
Fortunately, uh, as they were intellectuals, uh, they were never able to actually do any uh, uh, attempts at, at, at violence or attacks. Um, and their, their um, you know, fascist ideology was expressed primarily through writings, including for Greenberg in his poetry and essays. There's a, an example of a drawing that he went to go along with one of his, um, one of his primitivist poems talking about the, the Jewish um, messianic pretender Shabtai Tzvi or Shabtai Tzvi. Oh, let's leave that one for later. In this book, I identify two primary areas in which primitivist art and literature operated, identity and aesthetics. The turn to primitivism was an escape from and a critique of the omnipresent politics of Jewish identity formation. Primitivism worked against the nationalizing aesthetics underlying the modern Jewish culture project because it rejects a stable national or folk identity and consequently rejects a stable archive of artistic themes, texts, or subjects. Without a folk, there is no canon. Without a collective other, there is no collective self. And Jewish primitivism was also an aesthetic enterprise. By uncovering alternative artistic traditions, primitivism probed the formal possibilities of art and literature. Artists and writers capitalized on these new developments, not only to thematize notions of Jewish identity, but above all, to transform their works as such. Let me get off of the Greenberg thing. The results were diverse. My aim in the book was not to offer an exhaustive list. It would have been a very, very long book full of uh, all kinds of examples and wouldn't have been able to sustain any um, in-depth analysis. Um, but my, my hope was to begin drawing the map of Jewish primitivism and to point out some of its most notable features. My book shows that Jewish primitivism encompassed a range of techniques and possibilities conditioned by both the aesthetics of primitivist modernism more broadly and the politics of Jewish identity in Europe, but that it was ultimately responsive to its own internal aesthetic agenda. This is especially true for the chapter I'm going to present to you now about the Yiddish writer Der Nister. As you consider how what I'm about to present fits into what I've just sketched about my book um, in, in, in general, you'll see that it's a case right at the limits of Jewish primitivism, where a distinctively Jewish identity is no longer directly in play and is instead replaced by a universalizing primitivism. Yet, Der Nister's works were written in Yiddish for a Jewish audience and evoke Ashkenazic and Hasidic folklore. So in the tension between his universal thematics and his Jewish context, their Nister was aiming directly at a troubling question for Yiddish writers with revolutionary politics. And in fact, for Yiddish writers in general, how Jewish should your writing be? That question itself plays off of another question, perhaps the central question for most European Jewish writers in those decades. What is Jewish literature anyway? Der Nister's approach to primitivism turns this inside out. Instead of essentializing Jewish identity, he diffuses it. This tracked with the general tendency in the avant-garde away from a representational primitivism toward a formal or conceptual primitivism. Der Nister's Jewish context made the relation and confrontation of these two extremes, the particular and the universal, central to his primitivism. What was at stake for Der Nister was not how to make a Jewish version of something universal, but how to make a universal version of something Jewish. And with that, let's see if I can prove my case. I'll start with a quotation from Der Nister. So I walked and walked on the path and at sunset, which I looked up toward, and from time to time, from one time to the next, found the sun more set and more settled. A minute and two, slowly and more, and the sun already disappeared from the horizon completely. And suddenly, and I saw far, far away facing me and where the sun set, some kind of small and local animal appeared, and illuminating and illuminated it revealed itself and stood still, end quote. These mystifying lines are from a story by Der Nister. The repetition, the rhythm, the non sequiturs, these are all hallmarks of his obscure style. His pen name signals his resistance to accessibility, Der Nister, the hidden one. Born Pinchas Kahanovich in Berdichev, then the Russian Empire, now Ukraine in 1884, Der Nister grew up in a pious household, finding his way, like so many others of his generation, first to Hebrew and then to Yiddish literature. He also eventually found his way, like so many of his peers, to Berlin in the early 1920s. 
By that point, he had published a number of stories and short books, staking his claim to a style typically associated with Russian symbolism. Although this was not a tack taken by many other Yiddish writers, and though his pseudonym makes it clear that he cultivated his status as an outsider, he was nevertheless in the center of the Yiddish avant-garde. By the time he came to Berlin in 1921, he had spent about two years in Kiev, associated with the writers and artists of the Kulturliga group, and had published books with illustrations by the already famous Mark Chagall and the soon to be famous L. Lisitsky. But it was in Germany that he was pu to publish the book that made his name and that remains his best known contribution to the Yiddish canon, the collection of very strange folklore inspired stories called Gedacht, Imagined. Published in Berlin in two volumes in 1922 and 1923, a rarity held at among other places, Stanford Library. Der Nister's avant-garde works culminated in a collection of stories written during and just after his German period and published in Kiev in 1929 in a volume titled Fin meine Gita, From My Estates. These stories all willfully resist interpretation. My approach at deciphering them begins with situating Der Nister's works in contemporary primitivist visual theory, especially that of the German-Jewish avant-garde theorist Karl Einstein. In the early stories of Gedacht, the connection to this context first becomes apparent. Then two late stories from von Meine Gita show his fully fledged primitivist aesthetics and their political consequences. Reading Der Nister's works as literary examples of primitivist visuality reveals that they are only obscure if the standard of interpretation is in reference to measures of literariness, such as thematics or style. But while Dernister's prose was grand, you know, clearly grounded in literary traditions, both secular and Jewish, his primitivist visual theory afforded him a way to vault over the political pitfalls of this particular genealogy. Soviet critics castigated him for his enmeshment in what they saw as a reactionary, ethnically particular bourgeois tradition, because they did not see that his alternative aesthetic paradigm allowed him to use old building blocks for a radically new project. Der Nister's primitivism was based on visuality because it was the most effective, perhaps the only way to write literature that achieved two interrelated and seemingly unattainable goals. The renunciation of the subject-centered tradition of Western literature and the avoidance of Jewish particularity in texts that remained distinctly Yiddish. The impenetrable obscurity of Der Nister's works is explicable as an aesthetics of paradox literature built out of and against its precedents, Jewish yet universal, individual yet collective, traditional yet revolutionary, visual yet literary. This paradoxical project, together with Der Nister's difficult style and his convoluted plots, makes his works hard to understand, and that is probably an understatement. Critics from his time to the present have taken several tacks. Some have simply registered their confusion with resignation or frustration. For example, no less than Yudlamid Peretz could not make sense of his putative disciple. Mm -hmm. After reviewing some of his works, Peretz angrily wrote to Der Nister that he couldn't understand them. <laughs> Der Nister's response, which he fortunately shared only with a friend and not with Peretz, was to quote the Hasidic master, Reb Aaron Karlina, Konst, no willst nicht. You can, you just don't want to. In a more productive vein, scholars have situated Der Nister in the context of Peretz's folklorism or Hasidic literature, especially of Reb Nachman of Bratzlov, or Russian symbolism, or his politics. These accounts have explained many of the peculiarities of his works, particularly their thematics and symbolism, and exegetical approaches have been among the most productive, plotting Der Nister's works in the field of symbol and allegory. As already noted, some of the strange features of Der Nister's works would also have been familiar to readers of contemporary Russian literature, specifically the array of styles and techniques called symbolism. For example, his works reflect the symbolist interest in the supernatural, the occult, and mysticism, as well as folk literature and mythology. Der Nister also deploys uh, aspects of the symbolist approach to language, often emphasizing the sonic over the semantic, including his characteristic repetitions, parallelism, and homophonous neologisms. There are a whole lot of words that aren't really words in Der Nister. Indeed, although Der Nister's debt to the romantic Kunstmärchen, as well as to Hasidic and Jewish folklore is often cited, his style also strongly reflects the universalizing tendencies of Russian symbolism, specifically 
by deploying rhetorical techniques that are generally archaic and obscure, evoking myth with a capital M rather than any particular myth. The concept, uh, another idea that helped plot Dernister is the concept of ornamental prose, described by Dernister's contemporary, the Russian literary theorist, Viktor Shklovsky. Shklovsky defined this phenomenon as, quote, a shift in favor of the image, end quote, which he said results from, another quote, the general feeling that the old form has lost its resilience. Ornamental prose deployed a range of rhetorical devices from the familiar to the obscure, including alliteration, various forms of repetition, including that of roots couched in different prefixes and suffixes, which is one of the things that can make their nister so uh, confusing to read, and the rhyming of similar grammatical forms. Such rhetorical tactics, among many others, are found again and again in their stories. Yet for all their self-conscious complexity, a central element of ornamental prose is notably absent in their Nister stories. Shklovsky writes that in ornamentalism, we find, quote, the loosening of plot structure because imagery prevails over plot, end quote. Indeed, in ornamentalist texts, the plot is often elided entirely. But this absence of the narrative element is not a feature of their Nister's texts. The ornamentalism of his prose can distract from what is actually an abundance of plot. His stories show an obsession with all elements of plot, narration, structure, and the architecture of a story, um, most broadly. His stories contain an abundance of complex structural elements, and I'll show you in a little bit how that works. So my focus in understanding Dernister's stories is on form, not in order to sidestep his stance toward politics, the Soviet Union, or the revolutionary potential of art, or his use of folklore and Hasidism, or his symbolism. In fact, Ernister's use of visual principles in the creation of literary texts was his ingenious way of fusing all these disparate elements. His works managed to be universal and particularly Jewish, revolutionary and connected to tradition. The connection between these various aspects of Ernister's work is made through a distinctive primitivism that operates in the formal aspects of the text. At first glance, this primitivism seems to be, as I've said, um, of a more typical variety restricted to content, themes drawn from Jewish, Slavic, and other folk literatures, as well as the archaicizing rhetoric with which they were conveyed. This kind of so-called soft primitivism was shared by other Yiddish writers in the period who also looked to forebears like the early Hasidic master Nachman of Bratislav or the more recent leader of the trend Peretz. But none of these writers attempted anything near the formal complexity or frankly the weirdness of Der Nister's works. For example, Sumbag to the mountain from Gedacht, which is the story that I quoted from uh, at the beginning of this section on Dernister. Sumbag is a story narrated in the first person about a wanderer who, under the guidance of an old man, sets out from Granny's house to the mountain. On the way in the forest, he meets a hunter who tells him a tale. Later, in a steppe, he meets a beggar who tells him a tale. Then, by a river, he meets a stork who tells him a tale. Then after years of wandering, he comes to a cave where he finds a conclave of men clad in black robes. He then meets a fox, an eagle, a mole, and a skull. None of them tells him a tale, but then he meets a cuckoo who does. Finally, at the end of the story, he hears a voice and sees the cloud man, who then paraphrases to him some of the opening lines of the story describing the wanderer back in Granny's house. The degree of narrative complexity here goes beyond the romantic device of the simple framing narrative. But this does not approach the complexity of Dernister's most elaborate structures. In fact, it is relatively straightforward. It consists essentially of one narrative level that contains an extended sequence of horizontally embedded parallel narratives. The conclusion of the story introduces the greatest complication, fusing the primary narrative level back to its own beginning creating a kind of mise en abime or endlessly regressing story within a story. As the wanderer nears the end of his quest, he finds a scroll and reads it. When he finishes reading it, his experience of wandering combines with the experience of reading and he sees his own story. Quote, and just when I finished reading the scroll, a thought occurred to me as if from afar behind me and seemingly above me, a voice called out to me, wanderer, wanderer, and when I turned to the voice and to the cloud man, I opened my eyes and saw, 
quietly and at midnight. And so the first person narrator reads and hears and sees the beginning of the text in which he finds himself, puncturing the story's frame. The final paragraph is a mere quotation of a portion of the beginning of the story. This quotation is introduced with the line, quote, and I opened my eyes and I saw. The wanderer thus sees the textual effect of the narrative turning back on itself. The narrative metalepsis is accomplished by means of a conflation of visuality and textuality that enables a confounding textual recursion. It's not only described visually, but the very device, mise en abîme, is by definition visual, describing the technique in uh, medieval heraldry of placing a smaller shield in the center of the larger one. So visuality opens up the conceptual possibility for the formal techniques Der Nister employs. This is the basis of Der Nister's primitivism, the use of principles of visuality to shape his literary works. What makes this primitivist? The dramatic ending of Zumbarg, conflating visuality and textuality to affect a complex narrative metalepsis, describes a process of seeing that is both part of the plot and also an explanation for the narrative structure. This form of visuality is the entry point to Dernister's primitivism, because the role of seeing and perception in the creation of art is the central issue in primitivist aesthetics. And how does primitivist visuality enter into literature? The challenge of relating the visual to the textual was a central concern of Carl Einstein, a German Jewish art historian and theorist who was one of the earliest champions and explicators of cubism, and also one of the first to produce a primitivist aesthetic theory. Quote, I've long known that this thing we call cubism goes far beyond painting, end quote. Einstein wrote this in a letter to uh, Daniel Henri Kahnweiler in about 1921. Kahnweiler was a German Jewish art dealer in Paris and along with Einstein, the other principal expositor of cubism. At first glance, Einstein's claim makes little sense. Cubism was an artistic movement begun by painters and developed by painters. Yet Einstein maintains that it must be transferable from one artistic realm to another. He went on, quote, I've long known that not only is a reformation of sight possible and thereby of the effect of movement, but a reformation of the verbal equivalent is also possible, end quote. So what would this look like in literature? In his letter to Kahnweiler, Einstein mentioned a handful of features such a text might have, quote, the loss of language or the dissolution of an individual or the disunification of the sense of time. Simple themes, he concludes sardonically. Right, he just threw that out there. Um, and I'm gonna skip over it now, but, but in the book I, I um, talk a little bit about some of his actual attempts in literary text to do those things. Uh, and as he discovered, and as he talks about in his letter to Kahnweiler, it's much harder to do than to theorize. We can understand these ideas that he talks about in relation to his early visual theory, systematically, if concentratedly elaborated in his groundbreaking 1915 book, Negro Sculpture. And here's an image from it which offered a primitivist aesthetics flexible enough to be applied to literature and was apparently the first art historical treatment exclusively focused on African art. Um, very problematic in a number of ways, some of which Einstein himself recognized in the second edition of the book published a few years later, nevertheless quite groundbreaking. This short book, Negro Sculpture from 1915, promotes African sculpture as an antidote to the subject-centered pictorial illusionism of Western art. The book combines a short essay on African sculpture with 119 photographs, all of which are like this, uh, which present African sculpture as kind of like disembodied in a sterile environment. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite clear exactly where he got the, the photographs from. There's been some recent work tracking this down, but essentially these things were presented divorced from their, um, from their particular geographic, religious, and political contexts. In essence, his book was an inventive justification and explication of cubism based on an interpretation of African sculpture in which Einstein saw the same processes that were at work in the first phase of cubist painting. 
So while the book was ostensibly about African sculpture, it was also, and maybe primarily, a theory of primitivist aesthetics. One of Einstein's main innovations in this work is his explanation of the organization of spatial elements in the sculptures. This was his primary preoccupation, although he also talks about certain religious and, and uh, phenomenological aspects of the, of the viewing of African art. Uh, so talking about the spatial elements, he said, quote, Negro sculptures are marked by a pronounced individuation of their component parts. The parts are oriented not according to the beholder's point of view, but from within themselves, end quote. The purpose of this reorganization is to eliminate what Einstein calls the temporal function. He writes, quote, the intuition of space evinced by this kind of work must totally absorb cubic space and express it in a unified way. Perspective or the customary frontality are prohibited here. The work of art must present the entire spatial equation for it is timeless only when it excludes a temporal interpretation based on kinesthetic mental images. It absorbs time by integrating into its form what we experience as movement, end quote. So to kind of unpack this uh, a little bit briefly, what he means by the temporal function is actually the time it takes to move around a sculpture in order to see it all. Since of course you can't see all of the sculpture from one spot. Um, African sculpture absorbs time because it absorbs space. This means that it removes the need for movement, at least as he understood it. You can see it all from one spot. The equation of space and time is crucial, of course, for the transfer from visual theory to textual practice. It's important to note, however, that for Einstein, removing the temporal function does not mean representing something frontally, which is an arrangement, as he puts it, quote, of the foremost parts according to a single viewpoint, that is, traditional perspectival representation. This kind, uh, this is what he describes, quote, as an optical naturalism of Western art, and it is not the imitation of external nature. The nature that it passively imitates is merely the vantage point of the viewer, right? So for him, uh, it's, it's an illusion. The claim of visual realism is an illusion. What it reproduces is not how something actually is in space, but how a single viewer perceives it. In African sculpture, by contrast, quote, the three-dimensionally situated parts must be represented simultaneously, which means that the dispersed space must be integrated into a single field of vision. There's a lot more to this very dense text, uh, but to kind of recapitulate the salient points. First, rather than representing a fixed image, African sculpture represents the process of viewing, a process in part physiological and in part cognitive. The dominant understanding of the visual fragmentation which characterized cubism and was thought to be found in so-called primitive art had been advanced by Kahnweiler in his short book, The Rise of Cubism from 1920. Kahnweiler famously argued that visual fragmentation that you see in, in cubist paintings was reassembled in the mind of the spectator in a process that he likened to the Kantian synthesis, thus solving the problem of what he called the piercing of the closed form. Einstein, insisted that achieving coherence is actually beside the point. The point is the experience of viewing itself, which produces its own kind of non-mimetic reality. Second, for Einstein, the obviation of mimetic representation led to the rejection of what he regarded as the chief culprit in the illusionistic sham of Western pictoriality, namely perspective. Third, the absorption of space involves the absorption of time by eliminating the need to move through space and time around the sculpture. This means that the removal of perspective is reflected in the simultaneity, and that's an important word for Einstein, the simultaneity suggested by the fragmentation and reintegration of the parts of African sculpture. The reformation of vision, as he called it, extends far beyond painting, not only as an epistemological or aesthetic matter, but also maybe even primarily because it is political. In fact, politics is arguably the overarching agenda of Einstein's aesthetics. In short, the revolutionary effect of African sculpture is the destabilizing of the viewing subject. Or as Einstein writes toward the end of Negro sculpture, quote, all individuality is annihilated, 
By annihilating the way that Western artworks fix their viewers in place, African sculpture creates a different kind of subjectivity. With the elimination of individuality, the ground is cleared for revolutionary new forms of subjectivity and social organization. As Einstein wrote elsewhere, quote, primitive art, rejection of the capitalized art tradition, European mediatedness and tradition must be destroyed. There must be an end to formalist fictions. If we explode the ideology of capitalism, we will find beneath it the sole valuable remnant of this shattered continent, the precondition for everything new, the simple masses who are today still burdened by suffering. It is they who are the artist, end quote. Restoring art to the masses required first annihilating the individual and the myth of individual creativity. Darnister would take up all three challenges of Einstein's primitivism. First, the transfer of visual principles to literature. Second, the destabilization of aesthetic norms. And third, the fracturing of the I, the ego. That his works drew on Hasidic and other Ashkenazic folk traditions in the model of Peretz, but were motivated by an altogether different type of primitivism meant that he was able to leap beyond the lingering exoticism and folklorism of Peretz and his many followers. Der Nister's folkloric thematics promoted very different aesthetics and politics. Situating Der Nister's works in the ideological landscape of avant-garde primitivism clarifies the relation of his stories to his politics, which has been seen as something of a mystery. After his return to the Soviet Union, his works were the subject of a critical debate, a vociferous debate, about the matter of what they called Nisterism and its politics. He was accused of being apolitical or worse, reactionary. His defenders tried to portray his work as a bridge between the Jewish avant-garde and acceptable forms of Soviet literature. Among scholars, there is likewise no consensus on how to situate their Nister's works politically. Some have discerned anti-Soviet critique in his works, while others have pointed to his evolving politics ranging from a sort of idiosyncratic utopianism to a, eventually a contrite submission to Soviet aesthetics. I argue that Darnister's annihilation of individuality should be read as an aesthetic argument from which his politics emerge secondarily, but confidently. The narrative techniques used to deconstruct individualistic subjectivity do so by creating plural collective forms of description and narration. As with Einstein's primitivist aesthetics, the consequences are far reaching. Breaking down the individual centrality clears the way for collectivity. Uh, and here I'll give you, uh, before wrapping up, an in-depth look at how this works. So Dernister's primitivism addresses the ego. Accordingly, its most striking manifestations are found in his only two stories that feature a first person narrator, both of which are from the collection from Meine Gita from 1929, uh, and neither of which he had previously published. These two late stories, one, Fin Meine Gita, which gives the collection its title, From My Estates, and the other, Ameise mit Aletz, mit Amois, und mit dem Nister allein, a tale of an imp, a mouse, and Der Nister himself, mark the culmination of Der Nister's primitivism. The introduction of a character named Der Nister and the formal complications that intersect with the first person narrator mark the most significant change from the earlier to these later works. So an example of the earlier works would be Zumbag, which I discussed uh, a little while ago. In these two stories, these late stories from Funmani Gita, and I'm gonna talk about just one of them now, Der Nister has found a way to generate the instability of authorial authority as part of the structure of the work, not merely describing it. I'll walk us through Amaisa Mitaletz. The story achieves its formal complexity through a series of subtle shifts that amount to a narratorial structure that is difficult to determine and just as hard to describe. This is, of course, the point. And let me just say that reading it and figuring it out and then actually trying to write about it was like a hell of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so here we go. Dernister, the character, acquires the pelt of an imp, a kind of demon, for a coat and he is infected with a debilitating and life-threatening disease by an insect inhabiting the pelt. A doctor tells him that he can only be cured by reuniting the pelt with the imp it came from. Surveying the charnel ground in search of the requisite imp bones, he is aided by a mouse who had formed a romantic bond with the imp. 
Ernister restores the pelt to the correct bones, whereupon the imp is made whole again. The imp and the mouse then proceed to get married. For entertainment at the wedding, Dernister, again hale and hearty, tells a tale, a story about Dernister himself. All this takes place in the first three pages. <laughs> the remainder of the tale, wait for it, the remainder of the, of the text consists of the tale that Dernister tells at the wedding. Interestingly, although these first pages, the frame narrative, or so it would seem, are told in the third person, there is no switch once Dernister's embedded tale begins. The narration continues in the third person. In the first few lines, this is accomplished through indirect speech, meaning that Dernister's voice is approximated even as the third person perspective is maintained. But the text slides promptly into quoted speech, assuming the typical contour of third person omniscient narration. At first, this poses no, well, relatively no problems, relatively speaking. We are told how Dernister travels to a city of glass people and teaches them to become flesh. How their newfound fleshiness and excess fattiness caused a mouse infestation and how they therefore wanted revenge against Dernister and how Dernister was saved by the arrival of a mouse catcher. So far, so good. But here begin the complications. The narrator intrudes to say that the mouse catcher departed because, quote, staying there any longer made no sense. Since the story would repeat itself again and again, mouse catcher, mice, fat, and nister. Nister, fat, mice, and mouse catcher, end quote. Note that this is not a direct repetition, but a mirror image. Mouse catcher, mice, fat, and nister. Nister, fat, mice, and mouse catcher. But the departure of the mouse catcher precipitates exactly that, the development of the story as a kind of funhouse mirror image of the first part of the story, generally inverted, but containing disorienting disfiguration. Moreover, at this point, the narration enters the realm of the impossible. I mean, <laughs> even less possible, even more impossible. We're still in the story Dernister is telling at the wedding, but the narration now describes events at which Dernister was not present. The impossibility is justified by the narrator once again in terms of the demands of storytelling. If the mouse catcher's story had not proceeded, quote, we would not have had anything more to tell and the story would have had to be cut off here right in the middle, end quote. The story then continues with the mouse catcher until the narrator says that he cannot continue with the story of the mouse catcher, quote, because there would not be enough paper or ink, and I only want to tell about Der Nister himself, Begin Der Nister allein, end quote. Remember that the story is meant to be told by Der Nister. Here we finally seem to have a full disconnection of the narratorial voice from Der Nister's presumed voice. And here, about halfway through the text pages, and that's only halfway, we are given its proper beginning learning how it is Darnister became ill from a bug bite. A man on a star throws a coin to Darnister, who uses it to buy an imp pelt for a coat. But when he begins to scratch and be tortured by his illness, quote, he saw his life backwards in the reverse direction, end quote. What then proceeds is an inverted version of the first story. Nister and his donkey travel to a city of fleshy people and teach them to become glass people, devoid of fat. The difference between this and the first version is that this one is described as something Der Nister saw. It is in this vision that the narration reverses course and mirrors itself, continuing in this vein until he and his donkey are again pelted with stones, at which point the text again notes that Der Nister sees the entire story proceeding backwards. And then Dernister sees, the verb is der Zane, the beginning of the story again, the man on the star throwing him a coin. After he envisions all of this, he suddenly sees the insect that bit him, goes to a doctor who tells him the cure and affects the cure. Can you imagine? <laughs> And so the structural and plot inflection points, the places where the narrative fragments are marked by the verb to see. If you recall, the narrative metalepsis of the end of Zumbag, the first story I discussed, is also accomplished by means of a conflation of visuality and textuality. 
as the main character sees a quotation from the beginning of the story. It is visuality that determines for Danister the formal possibilities of his works. The ending of Maisa Metalets brings us back to the wedding at the beginning of the text where Danister was telling his tale. Quote, and Dernister was healthy again, and Mazel Tov, and good fortune for all your days. And in thanks and for a wedding present, I give you my insect. And again, Mazel Tov, and good fortune for all your days." End quote. As the story ends, the narratorial voice returns to Dernister and becomes, for the first time, first person. A measure of narratorial wholeness is achieved in the wake of the marital union of the mouse and the imp the reunion of the imp bones with its fur and Dernister's own recuperation. A happy ending in some ways. I mean, you've gotten to the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. Yet in the wake of all the various forms of authorial and narrative metalepsis and inverted storylines, the gesture toward a proper resolution is strikingly ironic. It is just as destabilizing as the preceding pages of active narrative confusion. The closed form has been pierced, and as Einstein argued, it is not to be put back together again. The process of breaking apart and reconfiguring form and space, or in the case of literature, form and time, is a process of destabilizing the narrating and the reading subject. By amalgamating narratorial voices and eliding differences in perspective, Dernister suggests that a unitary narrator named Dernister does not and cannot exist. I've described how the formal complications at work in Dernister's stories reflect a primitivist understanding of visual and literary form. The form of his works, as much as their themes and their rhetorical tricks, are related to avant-garde approaches to ethnographic and folkloric sources. But what he produces is not a stylization of myth or folklore that remains fully in the grasp of the author. In Dernister's stories, narration exceeds authorial control, even as it is indisputably a product of authorial invention. And now to conclude, I'll connect a little bit to, to what I discussed at the very beginning. As I've shown by connecting Dernister's aesthetics to Karl Einstein's, this is primitivism in general. But it's also, of course, Jewish primitivism. Only by starting from the folkloric tradition that Peretz had placed at the center of modern Yiddish literature could Dernister move away from it. In the 1921 Yiddish manifesto Skulptur, the sculptor Yosef Tchaikov voiced a critique of primitivism that reveals, by contrast, just what it was that Dernister accomplished. Describing the recent accomplishments of Jewish avant-garde sculptors, Tchaikov asked what connection their innovations relating to abstraction, the depiction of masses in space, the interrelations of pictorial planes, and so on, you know, all that, all that avant-garde stuff, what that might have to Jewish art of the past. Tchaikov's answer, there is no connection. Jews have no tradition of sculpture, therefore there can be no Jewish sculpture. Tchaikov argued further that because of this lack of tradition, the Jewish sculptor is particularly fortunate, right? This is lucky, he's arguing. Fortunate to have unfettered access to the range of developments in the plastic arts from futurism to cubism to constructivism. But one of these major trends troubles Tchaikov and that is primitivism. He ends his manifesto with a warning against a futile search for a usable past. Quote, we consider the approach of the young artists of the left incorrect they wish to solve the problem by recourse to the archive of our past and our folk primitive style. This leads to stylization and stylization to aestheticization. That is a lie given the pr present circumstances and capricious individualism in service of beauty." End quote. Right, so obviously his critique is coming from even farther left. Although his disdain for primitivist stylization seems absolute, Tchaikov did admit, even if unwittingly, that the situation was actually not quite so simple. A few pages earlier, describing the achievements of the various schools of the avant-garde, Tchaikov noted the debt owed by Cubism to African art. So if Cubism is permitted, you know, uh, by Tchaikov to draw on African art, then Tchaikov's refusal to admit primitivism in Jewish art, despite its presence at the heart of so much of the art that he admires, reveals his ideological stance. Revolution, universality, the future and abstraction were on one side, reaction, particularity, history, and figuration on the other. The masses on one side, the folk on the other. <laughs> 
But Der Nister's stories show that Tchaikov's analysis is not quite correct, at least not regarding literature. Der Nister managed to encompass both universality and particularity, tradition and revolution, by structuring his literature visually. The formal complexity of Darnister's works takes up the challenge that Carl Einstein showed that primitive art could pose to the subject-centered traditions, both literary and visual, of Western representation. If in Mysa Mithalets, it is difficult to locate the narrator in the chronology of the work, if it's challenging to distinguish the narrator's Darnister and Darnister the narrator and Darnister the author, then we found a crucial step in the conversion from I to we, and we've identified the place where the Jewish folk and the universal masses overlap. Dernister's answer to the struggle between particularity and universality, between Jewishness and whatever the alternatives were, was not or, but and. Thank you. We can take some questions here live and um, we can tell them to type into the Q&A. Yes, if you have any questions, type it into the Q&A uh, viewers on the webinar. Yes. And um, Shana will monitor the questions. Yes. Questions about uh, about Dernister or about my whole book? Anything about Ariel? Thanks, Sam, for opening up this whole world. It's fascinating. Um, like you say, when you were done unpacking the Dernister story, I had a little bit more sympathy for Paris's dismissal. <laughs> um, I have two questions, and you can answer them however you see fit. The first is, you know, several of the sources that you brought, and probably there are more in the book, deal with populism and mysticism in interesting ways. I'm wondering if there's is there reflection on mysticism as this category that's emerging in the early 20th century and all of the sort of orientalism and colonialism that's happening around that. Is that useful to your story? And I was wondering if you could then, um, in a different vein, just reflect briefly on the Hebrew version of this story. Um, which obviously I'm sure looks very, very different. You call this the Yiddish version. I'd love to hear a little bit about the Hebrew version. You mean of the of the general oh, discourse, right? Of primitive Jewish primitivism. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll start with Dernister and move out from there. Um, the you know the question of of Dernister's relation to Jewish Hasidic and mystical tradition is very complicated, um, and it evolves over the course of Dernister's career. He came from a um, a Hasidic background. His brother became a a Breslover Hasid. Um, and uh, another brother moved to Paris and became an art dealer. Um, and apparently that art dealer's, um, part of his collection was donated, I think, to the Musée d'Orsay. And you can still go into the museum in the Kahanovich room and see the, you know, the amazing works of art owned by Dernister's brother. Not the Brest Lebrechasset, but the other one. Um, so Dernister was intimately familiar from, from both the influence of his milieu and from his brother with like the specifics of you know, that most esoteric and most literary of, of Hasidic mystical traditions. And a lot of that plays a much more um, significant role in his earliest works from even before the Gedacht collection. Once he starts getting into Gedacht, he's starting to try to move in a more universalizing direction because this corresponds. I mean, the collection contains stories from earlier and then up to around 22, um, but his, his First, his participation in the Kulturliga, you know, this, this uh, trying to fuse um, the, the folk primitive, as they called it, style of, of Jewish tradition with something, you know, more avant-garde. And then once he gets to Berlin with his exposure to the, the German avant-garde, that's really, I think, what kicks off uh, that, that motion that leads toward that strange kind of diffusing of, of Jewish primitive identity that I talk about. So that's kind of a long way of saying that there's a lot of stuff with Dernister and mysticism, and I don't talk about it in the book. Um, but there are some, some interesting sources uh, and interesting articles that do talk about some of those works where, where he gets more directly into mysticism. Now, the question of the, the role of Hasidic literature more broadly, specifically around Paris, is very important to the story I tell in the book. And the, uh, basically, the, um, the first chapter of my book is about Paris. 
um, and Paris is kind of the foil for the, the idea of Jewish primitivism, both as I use him to start building out the idea as I, as I argue it of Jewish primitivism, but also he was the foil for so many of these avant-garde writers and artists um, in the same way that Chagall in the visual arts was for many of these artists. Um, I talk a little bit in the book, uh, in the sections where I talk about art, I have one chapter on photography. I talk about an artist, uh, Henrik Berlevi, who like so many of these other artists like Lasitsky, like these writers started off working in these spaces in the late teens that were you know, focused on, um, on stuff we identify now primarily with Chagall or that Berlevi in an essay identified with uh, Anski's The Dybbuk, which was like, and if you read Gabriella's amazing book about Anski, you'll, you'll see the depth of the influence of The Dybbuk. Berlevi talks about this in a reminiscence from like, 1924, so like just a couple of years later, but he had renounced figuration, renounced Jewishness in art, and he calls that whole thing, one of my favorite meanest critical terms, Chagallism. <laughs> it's like, you know, that art that like shows, you know, Jews dancing that's good for living room walls, right? Not real art, not constructivism, Chagallism. Um, Chagallism in the visual arts, Paratism in, <laughs> Uh, in literature. But Peretz was really important, and I talk about in the chapter the way that Peretz himself is ambivalent. He's doing two things. He's writing a lot of essays that critique what I call folklorism, that critique what's called in his contemporary um, Russian criticism, stylization, stylizatsia, which was good for the people who are theorizing stylizatsia, right? That's an aesthetic technique that you're supposed to like develop in order to capture something about the, the folk. Um, Peretz is ambivalent about that because he feels that it sort of captures you in mimicry. And when you're mimicking, according to Peretz, when a Jewish writer is mimicking, a Jewish writer is, and he doesn't articulate it in this way, but there are many adjacencies to you know, the, the later development of post-colonial critique. When you're mimicking, you're mimicking the hegemonic voice. And he actually, in one essay, talks about how sad it is to see African children schooled in European colonial schools where they learn how to be Europeans, but not how to be who they are, he says, right? And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want, um, he calls it uh, elsewhere that he says that Jewish writers are doing altskeminig Europe, everything according to the custom of Europe, Jewish poetry, but in a frock coat and white gloves, right? So he's arguing against that in his essays. And the weird thing that I talk about in the chapter is that in his most famous stories, he's doing the exact thing he's criticizing. His stories are called Hasidish, right? And that's a strange word, but it's very accurate because they're Hasid-ish. Um, and, you know, a lot of critics, Agnon and Gladstein and, and lots of people, you know, people who had read actual Hasidic stories were like, wait a second, these aren't Hasidic at all. This is not what Hasidic stories are like. Um, and Peretz himself never really acknowledged that. In the German context, Buber is probably most similar to, to Peretz in terms of his importance, his influence, and the thing he was doing. But Buber acknowledged that he was changing the works. And he writes about it in the famous introduction uh, to, I think it was, the stories of Rabbi Nachman, where he says that, that Hasidic literature is handed down as if in a stammer. And he needs to fix that, right? Stylization, Europeanization, make it understandable. He doesn't have a critique. He wants, you know, his audience is as much non-Jews as Jews, more so. Peretz's audience, he's writing in Yiddish, is Jews, right? So he has this critique. Um, and it's that critique that then forms the basis for primitivism. Because primitivism is not, as it's formulated, as it's theorized, as it's put into practice, this is what I show in the book, primitivism is not stylization, it's not mimicry. It's the attempt to do the opposite, right? It's an attempt. Mm -hmm. Um, so the stylization, the mimicry, that's what I call folklorism. And until you see Peretz's struggle with that in his essays and in his stories, the development almost simultaneously of Jewish primitivism makes a lot less sense because it's harder to understand like, well, what's the problem with Peretz? Um, and also, you know, it, it also might be possible and I think has been in a lot of scholarship to overlook the fact that, um, that Peretz had a problem, in essence, with his own works. And, you know, I, there are definitely some scholars, um, including my, my erstwhile colleague, Ken Moss, who disagree with me on this. Um, 
that, you know, that, that Paris's essays are ultimately, you know, a little bit wrongheaded and that this isn't about a struggle so much as, as a kind of uh, development and sophistication in his stories. I obviously disagree with that. I think that, that you know, both parts of this project are important um, and that there is something to be learned from bringing them both together. So, you know, in terms of the broader landscape of what's going on at the turn of the century, I use Peretz as the kind of paradigm, but this applies also to Buber and to any of, of the other people kind of imitating them. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, I, I keep thinking about that image of Elsa Lester Schuler um, at the beginning, dressed as the, the prince of the Society of Jewish Jews, <laughs> um, and and how that's um, that's maybe more Spinozia or folklorism, right? That's a kind of um, putting on of uh, something while um, while maintaining distance, sort of like the, the frock coat and the white gloves, yeah. right? Like it's, it sort of draws attention to surface. So the person is dressed up as something very outrageous and that makes you think this person is dressed up. That's not the reality. Yeah. And if I understand right, you're arguing that the minister is sort of not doing that. He is uh, sort of not, not wanting to draw attention to that kind of um, overlay or um, juxtaposition of two uh, kind of two, what he thinks, what, what one might think of as two kind of temporal yeah. levels. And instead he's trying to produce this formally new, strange thing. And I'm wondering if, um, if it makes sense to think of this repeated, um, moment in the story you analyzed of putting on the pelt mm -hmm. and taking off the pelt and finding that the pelt has sort of infected him and the pelt needs to be returned to its bones so that it can become a living imp that marries the mouse. Um, if that's, if that could be understood as a, a gesture that's a kind of um, like realization of the metaphor of not being Elsa Lester Schuler, yeah, right? Not being like, if you just don a pelt, right, <laughs> the pelt of an imp, yeah. then you're maybe indulging in parasism or Chagallism or folklorism or stilizatia. And if you remove the pelt and instead um, create this sort of weird, undecodable narrative, then you're, you're sort of very, very visibly uh, doing something else. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that's right uh, about Der Nister. Um, I think that that the you know his project is about um, moving beyond the the awareness or the recognition of a kind of forced layering. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I I think that I think that that's right. But I also think that there's a little bit more to to Lasker Schuler um, than. Yeah, well, I mean, so much of what she did was, you know, subject to caricature um, because of the way that that she presented it. Um, and certainly a lot of her contemporaries, including among the, the Yiddish writers and artists, saw her in that way. Um, but in the chapter about Lasker Schuler, I bring her together with, and this, you know, can maybe answer a little bit Ariel's question about Hebrew. Um, I bring her together with Uritzvi Greenberg. Um, you know, specifically around the, the figure of the Society of Savage Jews that he takes from her. But he uses her as inspiration and her poetry as inspiration because he sees her completely different from the caricature that, that you presented, which was a way that people saw her. So, you know, the, the sort of uh, Peter Berger's famous um, definition of the avant-garde as bringing, you know, art into life, life into art, um, was was definitely you know the correct definition of the avant-garde in relation to Lasker Schuler and Lasker Schuler's circle. This was not just her dressing up on occasion. This was just this was her. She did she she would sign letters, Prince Yusuf, if people addressed her, you know, um, you know, Frau Lasker Schuler, she would say, "Who are you talking to?" Right. This was 
this was a, a persona that that was her. Um, she she signed business letters, Prince Yusuf. Not always. She had other um, you know pseudonyms that she went by, um, but but there was a lot of Prince Yusuf. But it also appeared in works of fiction. It also appeared in works of art, and it also was her sitting at the table in the Romanisches Cafe, talking to Uritzvi Greenberg, talking to you know um, Moshe Kulbach or whoever, wearing, wearing, the outfit. wearing the outfit as Prince Yusuf. And um, I think, first of all, I mean, it's like Kafka has a famous passage in his diaries where she, uh, Laska Schuler came to Prague and you know she's doing her thing and he can't stand it. He's like rolling his eyes. He's like, this is the stupidest thing. Um, but he says it in a smart Kafka way, not, <laughs> not in the bratty teenage way that I just um, recapitulated him. But he, he can't stand it. This is like ridiculous to him. Um, he sees immediately just the awkwardness and the silliness of the whole project. Um, and from another perspective, and I talk about this in the book, um, and an important sort of recognition of primitivism is that it's racist. Um, it just, it is, right? So it's, it's, it's strange, especially from our perspective to try to recognize that a racist discourse is also like Jewish positive. Um, it's complicated to sort of work through the, the affective elements of that from our own angle as readers and viewers. Um, and Oscar Schuler has a number of works of art that are, you know, beyond the sort of racist uh, associations of primitivism, but are like directly and overtly racist um, with, with derogatory uh, and, and racist uh, slurs about uh, African Americans and Native Americans. Um, and, and plenty of examples of, of things like that. Um, but that was, that was sort of part of the whole thing. And I think that also can create a certain um, resistance if you're sensitive to that. And certainly plenty of people who are her contemporaries were sensitive to that. It's not like, you know, it was impossible for her to recognize that she was being racist. Other people did. Um, she just chose not to. Um, so, you know, all of that sort of creates layer after layer of uh, challenges to trying to, to understand the central gambit of her project, which was that this is not fake. Um, and ultimately, right, that experience for her is inaccessible to us because that was her sort of internal psychological experience and we're only interpreting her performance and representation of it. So, you know, it depends on your positionality as a reader. But for somebody like Uritzvi Greenberg, there's no question. He looked at her and he bought it. Uh, he was the source of the famous uh, anecdote that he, uh, he told uh, in his uh, speech that he gave when winning the Bialik Prize, I think in 1971, that, um, that he said to her, you know, uh, Elsa, I would love to translate one of your poems into Hebrew. And she said, but it's already written in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Right, she deeply believed that, and he wrote an essay that was uh, published in Gaval called Dvora Beshivya, Deborah in Captivity, where he essentially argued that that was true. Yes, she writes in German, but this is German that is, you know, he writes Gothic letters, but it's deeply Hebrew. It's deeply biblical. It's authentically, foundationally, way deep in that primitive Ur poetry thing inside of your Jewish heart is Hebrew. Um, and that's why for him, the Society of Savage Jews is like Zionist. You reach deep, deep into that heart, and that's what gives you, right? Then, but then he takes it one step further, and he pulls that dagger out of the scabbard that says, Ve'ahavta, right? So his, his Society of Savage Jews, and he talks about this in the essay, he wants the Society of Savage Jews to move to Palestine. And he said, if we could, you know, we're so impoverished and we're knee deep in the swamps, but if we could, we would come to Berlin and rescue you to help us build the, the land for the Jewish people. Because he sees that her project is actually deeply sincere, but was a, a sort of a identity project that was compromised by the diaspora, by exile, because she couldn't write in Hebrew, right? That for him, that was you know, the, the one limit. And everything else was the sign of her desperate desire to write in Hebrew. And she actually wrote him a postcard, which is preserved in the, um, in the archives in Jerusalem, where she tried to write Shalom on a postcard to him. And she has the letters Shin Lamed Mem. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of, a, I think there is something, you know, sympathetic and in a sense, 
correct about his reading of her. Um, but you know, for for our purposes, for my purposes, the you know the the broader implications are first of all that her project was understood to be a sincere project, and although some people read it as kind of a stylized performance, other people read it as you know uh, an actual performance of primitivizing identity. Um, but also, what's important is the introduction of the political valence because she was positioning herself as unpolitical, even though she clearly wasn't, she was friends with you know, these left-wing radicals and that was her bohemian circle. Um, but the, the sort of political resonances of primitivism were so easy to activate um, and, and like it's not a sort of distant road to travel, but it's just flipping the coin. And that was you know, most famously epitomized in, in visual art with the German painter, uh, Emil Nolde, was one of the greatest uh, expressionist primitivist painters and was an early member of the Nazi party. Right? And it's how, how can you go from a discourse that was for most of the people interested in it and doing it uh, far left and be a Nazi or, you know, but another radical right wing movement for Ritzvi Greenberg to be as he called himself, a fascist, um, and later, once he'd renounced that, a, a, a radical right-wing Zionist. And that's activated, of course, by the sort of, um, first of all, the, the racist overtones and undertones that can then be made the centerpiece of the discourse. Um, and it can also be activated specifically by the ways that, even though as we get with people like, with figures like Der Nister, there, there, with his you know, attempt to diffuse identity, the primitivism also essentializes identity. Whenever you're essentializing identity, you quickly run into problems. We have one question here, and then we'll hear from our two people, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, Mark Cohen asks, have you considered a more general Jewish interest slash passion for African sculpture among 20th century collectors? What about that sculpture speaks to the modern Jewish condition? The Smithsonian Museum of African Art was founded by Jews, for instance. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting story and there's a lot of, of really fascinating material there, but that's, that's not the story that I'm telling. Um, because what's interesting about these writers and artists that I talk about is that they're not doing this with African art. They could be, but they're not. They're doing it specifically with European Jewish art. Um, and they're moving European Jewish art and identity into the place that in other contexts, Jewish collectors and artists um, as well as all different you know, kinds of European artists and collectors had put African art, right? So there definitely is a story to be told there, but I think the, the kind of strange thing about the material that I'm talking about is that they're not doing that. In so many respects, that would be the more obvious way because that would be leaving it in the realm of analogy rather than doing this much more complicated thing where it's both an analogy and a, a sort of vision for what Jewish art is. So, you know that that is an interesting thing, but it's not something you're gonna you're gonna find in my book. Um, and uh, you know, as a methodological uh, question, you know, the an interesting way to answer that question would be, as you suggest, thinking about the history of collections. Um, in my book, I'm really focused on interpreting literary works and works of art, in um, you know, moving beyond or outside of the institutional or social discourses that helped create these things in looking at the works of art themselves, which is really where primitivism happens. Hey, Tom. Sam, thank you very much. This is really great. Um, I don't usually ask questions at events, but you told me at the beginning to ask you a question, so <laughs> I decided that I would. Um, the thesis that you presented around Jewish primitivism and their nister yeah. is offered in opposition to all of the other interpretive frames of how we see Dernister early on. And you spent a lot of time explaining why symbolism doesn't quite work, yeah. why ornamental prose doesn't quite work, yeah. why we actually need to have this additional theory. Yeah. And I fully, ex I, I buy your argument about what is happening here. And okay, then we're done. Is right. <laughs> so one of the interesting things with Dernister that has to happen, that has to happen in terms of theorizing his aesthetics is that his aesthetics radically change. Yeah. And this is in part obviously due to political circumstances, but early Dernister and late Dernister are uh -huh. very different writers. Yeah. So critics have found ways of kind of explaining what happens to the symbolism 
in its transformations to something like the family mashta. Mm -hmm. What happens to primitivism? Does primitivism you know, remain in a way that symbolism does not? Symbolism gets replaced by crypticism, but is primi or does primitivism persist? Do you have a, a sense of where this aesthetic story goes for Dear Nixer? And then my other question is, uh, is what does primitivism in terms of our aesthetic understanding of Dear Nixer exclude? Do we end with primitivism or is, primitive, is primitivism the new launching point for trying to re-engage with these stories in kind of different ways? But to the first question about Dear Nister is the entirety of his oeuvre. Um, you know, I think usually when, when authors talk about their own works, we should just, you know, set, set whatever they say aside. Um, but Dear Nister, <clears throat> has a, a, a powerful, one of the very few letters of his that, that survived. It's written to his brother, the art dealer in Paris. This is cited by Hona Schmerich, I think, um, where Danister writes to his brother, um, after a number of years of silence, he hadn't written because like I said, there was this you know, intense reaction to him um, where it was very clear that his life was at stake, right? They, they were not you know, playing for whatever that idiom is. Peanuts. Um, they were playing for lives. Um, and so he stopped, right? He didn't want to die. And he was still a, a committed communist. He wanted to live, he returned to the Soviet Union in 1927, right? On purpose. Um, so he wanted to stay and he recognized that he needed to change. And he writes to his brother that chain, chain, becoming a writer, a different kind of writer was like turning his soul inside out, right? Because there is this massive, tremendous break Right? And one of the amazing things about Dernister is that, is that both, he's good at both styles and how many writers are able to, to do that, such radically different styles. But there is a massive difference, right? So I think it is interesting to try to retrieve the remnants of what was before and what comes later. Um, but I think we should also recognize that like, it's really, really different. And it's really, really different because it had to be in order to save his life. And so, I think it, you know, one of the things, one of the, one of the main things that would get you in trouble would be primitivism, right? This was um, like associated with German expressionism. This was associated with everything that by the late 1920s in the Soviet Union had become completely anathema, right? So if anything could even like gesture toward primitivism, that was going to raise a red flag. Um, and so, you know, I think he had like obvious overt reasons to avoid it. And so I think that, you know, generally speaking, that is something that ends with Finn Gita. Um, that's the last collection he publishes. It's essentially at the last minute that that could come out. And that, that's it. That's the end of the story of, of primitivism with him. Your second question about what this can do for reading Der Nister. Yeah, I mean, I hope, I, I, I hope for the whole book, right? That this is a prompt for other people to, to read, to reread, to think about, how this applies to either other works in the oeuvres of, of figures that I do talk about, um, or all the other characters out there who might have done adjacent or somewhat similar or really similar things to revisit it and to try to talk about it in the context of this sort of central discourse within European modernism. Um, so I don't think it's just like, you know, this trajectory that you go from Zumbar to, to these two uh, late Dernister stories, and that's the end of the story. I think that there's a lot more that you could do in going back through all of Dernister stories. Having said that, I'm not going to do it because because <laughs> um, I'm I'm done with it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I think I made the case as as good as I can, um, and you know, I would love it if other people would would visit other of Dernister stories to try to test it out. You know, and maybe this contention that I'm making that it is a that it is a fruitful prompt for further exploration of the other stories. Maybe that's wrong, right? Maybe somebody's going to say actually, it's just a plus of those two stories, and Spinner was wrong. You know, that would be interesting too to see how that works. But I think we haven't really tried to do any of it because we haven't yet read their Nister in this light. Is there one more question? Go ahead, Aline. Yeah, I was wondering how do you in the discussion about Jews and Orientalism and also on Hanan. Uh, like Emil Nolde was part of a variant of the National Socialist Party, but it was one in Schleswig-Holstein. Yeah. And it wasn't like related to the big 
So if you search for his party tag and the name, it isn't there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was still a Nazi. <laughs> so he wasn't as bad a Nazi as he could have been, but um, I think that's a distinction without much of a difference. Um, he was also a racist. Um, he was also, in all likelihood, an anti-Semite. Uh, he was also subject to the bitter irony that the Nazis later declared his work to be Antarctica Kunst. Right, so this is uh, you know a, a sort of dramatic and ironic and and just sad and horrible story. Um, what was the other aspect of your question about Nolde? Orientalism. Well, no, I remember Orientalism, but in terms of Nolde, it was just the comment about his his Nazi Party affiliation. Yeah, yeah. no, like I wasn't defending. Yeah, no, no, I know you. Well, who who would? Um, right, but you know, I, I think that I think that he's a good example, and you know, Russell Berman wrote an article in the eighties about Nolde's uh, primitivism and, and right-wing radicalism. Um, and I think that, you know, that's an important thing to recognize that primitivism is not just, you can't, it's not even just like shoehorning it in, it's something that's within primitivism that is sometimes brought out. Um, Orientalism, I talk about that in the Lasker Schuller chapters. It's obviously uh, regarding Elsa Lasker Schuller, most critics, um, you know, call her Orientalist um, and not primitivist. So for my purposes, I think that this sort of discursive space that Orientalism, some of the discursive space that Orientalism occupies uh, overlaps with some of the space that Jewish primitivism occupies. And that making an effort to distinguish between the two actually obscures the way that these projects um, have so much in common, right? So, you know, she could be Orientalist and primitivist. Um, and that doesn't make her less Orientalist or less primitivist. And I think what that does um, for the larger discussion of the relationship between Orientalism and, and, and Jewish culture is it, it you know, opens up that vista a little bit wider um, and shows some of the ways in which the discourse wasn't strictly um, <clears throat> East-West, right? Obviously that was the, the, the compass point for Orientalism. And that was the way, for example, that um, first of all, she built it in Prince Yusuf, right? Um, but, and that's the way Uritzvi Greenberg took it in his, you know, distinct geographic and political reorientation of her discourse. But there's also this backwards and downwards thing that's going on that's still a part of the Orientalism, but isn't only like the other forms of Orientalism that you might use to map her. Um, so, you know, I, the way I, I do it in the book is, is I say essentially that she's both. I guess you could finesse it and say it's a primitivist Orientalism or an Orientalist primitivism, but there's this space where both overlap. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Spinner. Thank you to all of the Zoom attendees for your engagement and for sticking around. And uh, we will end the Zoom now. Thank you. Thank you.